Today we're in week five, and our listed topic is Catholicism and the Counter-Reformation. I'm actually going to start out today with a couple things that I did not get done last week, which is I didn't get all of the growth of Protestantism part in that I wanted to. I want to talk about the growth of Protestantism in the Low Countries. That, for those of you who don't know that expression, that's what we know as Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Um, and then I want to talk about Protestantism and the Reformation in France. France. And then from there, <laughs> uh, we will get into Catholicism and Counter-Reformation. Now, I have quite a few notes here on the Reformation of the Low Countries in France because, like the English part, there's a whole lot of details. And I will just lecture on the, on the Catholicism because there's not nearly as much in terms of dukes and princes and kings and, you know, at one point in the French uh, Reformation, we had three guys named Henry, all of whom thought they should be king. It's very complicated, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, we'll go with that. Let's start out talking about the Reformation in the Low Countries. Now, near the mouth of the Rhine River, there's a group of territories which in this day, this day means at the end of the, the, the 15th century, into the 1400s, into the 1500s, because that's when we're talking about the Reformation, um, there were a group of territories that were called the 17 provinces. They were independent provinces. They gathered together later and formed three countries that we know, as I said, of the, as the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Now, all three of them had been part of the inheritance of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, because they had been part of the Habsburg Empire. And he was the heir of the Habsburg, you know, the, the uh, whole Habsburg Empire thing. And he had been, of course, the, the King of Spain, became the Holy Roman Emperor. So all of this had been connected with Spain as part of his Habsburg inheritance. Now, Protestantism came to these countries, if you know anything about the Netherlands especially, the Dutch, very Protestant. Well, Protestantism moved very quickly into these low countries uh, from the early time of the Reformation. In fact, in 1523, in Antwerp, in Belgium, were the first two Protestant martyrs burned. Now, 1523 is how many years after uh, Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral? Years. How much? Uh, six. six years? Six years. 1517? Come on, people! <laughs> 1517. Of course, there had been other Reformation movements, not just easy. Uh, there had been other Reformation movements, but um, this is the Lutheran movement in Germany was closest to them, and so we're only looking at six years after Luther started this whole thing that you had martyrs to the Protestant faith in the Low Countries. All right, now. Even though these provinces were all kind of loosely knitted together and they were all technically controlled by the same monarchs, there was very little unity in them. If you go there today and you go to the Netherlands, what language do they speak? Dutch. Dutch. If you go to Belgium, what do they speak? French, Flemish. Flemish. All kinds of stuff. French, yeah. Flemish, German, everything. But Flemish was the sort of the local language for a long time. And, you know, you get, uh, you go elsewhere into Luxembourg, you'll get more French speaking. So in these 17 provinces, you had a lot of different language groups, you had a lot of different senses, and so much of what we're talking about in this time, uh, you'll remember when we talked about Luther and all the attempts that Charles V and others had, to try, uh, had tried to make to stop Luther, it seems like something political kept happening that would prevent him from acting. He would, he would be getting an army ready to march into northern Germany and put down these rebellious Protestant princes, and all of a sudden the Turks would attack the, you know, the East, Eastern Europe, and he'd have to go there instead. Or the Pope would do something, he had to go deal with the Pope. So there was always something that was more politically oriented. Well, the same thing is true when we talk about the Reformation uh, throughout Europe, really, and you saw that a little bit when we talked about the, the Reformation earlier in Germany, you know, the, the, after Luther as it grew. There's political issues related here, and for these 17 provinces, it was a period of time in which there was a growing sense of nationalism, just like there had been in Germany, that were no longer just, you know, independent little groups of people, or like our own little city-states, or everybody's not thinking locally, they're beginning to think nationally, which is why they ended up turning into three countries instead of 17 provinces. But that nationalistic kind of view is a lot of what affected the way the Reformation happened there. We'll talk about that. But that nationalism, you get a sense of when you just see that they spoke different languages. They have very different cultural expectations. Now, in 1555, oh, I'm not even, I'm not even doing this. You guys yell at me when I don't show you this stuff, okay? 
1555, Charles V, who was the Holy Roman Emperor, and therefore technically the owner of these 17 provinces, uh, he put the provinces under his son Philip. You remember that Charles had such a hard time, eventually he just gave up and moved to a monastery in Spain. Well, as he got toward later in his reign, he started giving various things away. His brother Ferdinand took control of some areas by, by Charles's desire, and he started turning some of it over to his son Philip, who in 1555 he gave the 17 provinces to Philip to rule. And the next year, Philip also became the king of Spain. You wonder how these guys did all this stuff. Anyway, um, so he became Philip the, the second of Spain. Now, at the point in 1556 when Philip became the king of Spain, he didn't care about these 17 provinces anymore. I mean, they, they were, you know, they were nothing. He's, he's the king of, of Spain, for heaven's sake. So he heads back to Spain. Now... There had been problems all along because Charles V had actually grown up in this region. And, and Charles V was more comfortable speaking Flemish than anything else. So the people tended to like Charles V, even though he had some problems. Well, his son, Philip, who became Philip II of Spain, grew up in Spain. And he spoke Spanish. He didn't speak any of the languages that were common in the, in the provinces. They did not like him. And so there had been strain from the very first, in 1555, then when Philip went back to Spain, he made it very clear that as far as he was concerned, these 17 provinces were entirely subservient and secondary and an afterthought as far as he was concerned to what he thought was his primary responsibility, which was to Spain. Now, at that time, he appointed his sister to be, his half-sister actually, uh, Margaret of Parma. I'm just going to put all these things up here. Because I'm here. Thank you. Margaret of Parma. Um, to be regent, to take care of these 17 provinces, while he went back to Spain. But, in order to support his half-sister, Margaret of Parma, he left a large contingent of Spanish soldiers in these low countries. Well, there was no war going on. There was no reason for there to be Spanish soldiers on the soil, unless, the people said, he doesn't trust us. And we don't like him anyway. So there was this tension because these the Spanish soldiers, the small Spanish army that was there, they were living, you know, they, they had to support them. They had to feed these soldiers and take care of them, give them a place to live and everything else. And there was a lot of tension. Well, during all of this time, Charles V, of course, was Catholic. Philip was Catholic. Margaret was Catholic. All of these people were Catholic. You don't get much more Catholic than Catholic Spain in the 15th and uh, 16th centuries. And so... Um, but during this time, Lutherans were coming across from Germany, Anabaptists were coming up from Switzerland, Calvinists were also coming up from Switzerland. There was a big influx of different kind of Protestant preachers and teachers, and the region, it seemed like the Calvinists from, you know, from Geneva and elsewhere, that had gone from Geneva under John Calvin, they especially, during the 16th century, uh, focused on this area, and so Calvinism ended up being, of all the Protestant options, there were three main Protestant options, Lutheran, Calvinist, or Reformed, or Anabaptist. The Anabaptists everybody hated. In fact, uh, of, the, of the efforts that were made uh, to persecute, the Anabaptists were always the number one target. Um, and as I told you, there were more Anabaptists uh, martyred uh, in the first probably 20 years after Anabaptism was launched than all the Christians that were martyred in the first three centuries under the Romans. Okay? It was huge. <laughs> So anyway, all of these people were coming in, and yet the Calvinists seemed to take root better. I guess it's that dour Dutch thing, you know, they, in fact, the, the Netherlands became one of the centers of Calvinism worldwide. Um, and the Dutch Reformed Church, okay, uh, the Netherlands and uh, Scotland, where Presbyterianism came from, were the two primary Reformed or Presbyterian locations. So, uh, or Calvinist locations, rather. So Charles V had opposed Protestantism, and leading up to the time that he gave the, the place away to his son, he issued edict after edict after edict to try to suppress Protestantism. And tens of thousands of people were martyred during this time, okay? Um, especially Anabaptists. Anabaptists were always the number one target because nobody liked the Anabaptists. In fact, when they passed, uh, when they passed edicts of tolerance in northern Germany where they said the princes could have whatever religion they wanted, they said, as long as it's not Anabaptism, okay? Uh, even Calvin was involved in persecuting Anabaptists, and so they were not popular. But the very fact that Charles V issued edict after edict after edict to try to suppress it gives you some idea how successful he was being. 
you know, it simply wasn't working. Protestantism, for all of that persecution, for all of that, and, and Philip was even more intolerant than his father was about this. He was even more in, in dedicated to getting rid of them. At one point, um, Philip II, as we start getting into actual warfare over this thing in, in the Low Countries, he, he was quoted as saying, I will not be the lord of the heretics. And so he insisted that they, he was going to straighten these people out, bring them back to Catholicism. Okay? So he leaves his sister Margaret of Parma uh, Par there. Uh, in order, again, because he's not there anymore and his half sister is running things, he also wanted to make sure that the church had some power. So he, got, he made arrangements with the Pope to uh, create the Inquisition, or to give the Catholic bishops in the Low Countries the authority to pursue the Inquisition. Now, you remember the Inquisition in Spain, had that, Spain and Portugal is where it was worse, where they, it was really horrific. Well, when um, Philip, in his absence, with his half-sister running things, when he got approval for the bishops in this area to, to pursue the Inquisition, um, everybody's freaking out, because they know what happened when the Inquisition was in Spain, and they see Philip as being, he is Spanish, but they see him as being just an offshoot of that, and they're, you know, they see something really bad coming down the road. Well, he various, and, and at one point they sent one of the dukes, Duke Egbert, from the Low Countries to visit Philip in Spain, and he's, he receives the Duke, he welcomes him, he speaks kindly to him, he says all this positive thing, he makes all these promises of tolerance. And then, um, when the Duke goes back, did I say Egbert, it's Egbert, Egbert, when Egbert goes back to the Low Countries, he goes into a council, and he opens the letter, you know, that the officially sealed letter that, that Philip the King had given him, and starts reading it, and it's exactly contrary to what Philip had told him in person. And he discovers it in front of the council. So Philip proves to be completely duplicitous. He promises tolerance. And at the same time he's promising tolerance and smiling and saying all these positive things, he, at this point, we have the Council of Trent, which we'll talk about with the, with the Catholic Reformation. Um, the Council of Trent has issued all of these very severe edicts against Protestantism. And Philip, at the same time he's grinning and telling him it's going to be okay, he tells his half-sister Margaret, the regent, to ruthlessly enforce all of the decrees of the Council of Trent against Protestantism, which basically meant, you know, kill any of them that don't toe the line, that don't recant their Protestantism and come back into the faith. Well, several hundred nobles and, and bourgeoisie, basically that means business people, you know, they were, they were uppity middle class people, they weren't actually nobility, but they were wealthy and therefore powerful. They all uh, went to Margaret, the regent, uh, and presented her with a petition to not implement Council of Trent. Basically, don't launch this massive persecution against the people of the Low Countries, many of whom had now become Protestant. And one of her courtiers during this, Margaret was feeling you know, pretty scared. There's 200 nobles and bourgeoisie that are there telling her this. She's kind of scared, and one of her courtiers turns to her and says, you don't have to be afraid of these beggars. Well, instead of being offended by that, the, the beggars said, fine, if that's what you think about it, then we will claim the title of beggars. That became their name for themselves. We are the beggars, the beggars of Christ. In fact, the leather bag that beggars always carried became sort of the symbol of the whole Protestant Reformation movement in the Low Countries. And so since that had been the response they got, Philip had lied to them, Margaret took the counsel of some of her people and, and wouldn't even listen to them, then they decide it's time for war. And so both sides start preparing for war. And understand, at this point, even though there's a division between Protestant and Catholic, the primary motivations here have not been religious yet. They primarily have been nationalistic. The thing was, the Catholics were primarily fine with staying with a king who's Catholic and in Spain. So there was a religious connection, but that wasn't their main reason. The main issue was political. Well, now these beggars, who are the, uh, the people who are rebelling against this kind of control and against the threat of the Inquisition, etc., just happen to be almost all Protestant. There were a few Catholics with them. They start preparing for war, and when they gather in the field and everything else, they would have these services, and it became more and more and more religious. So it took on a much stronger religious overtone at this point, and it began to be seen as being between the Catholic rulers and what they want to do and the Protestants who are advocating for nationalism and tolerance in religion, okay? Um, now, at that point, 
as everybody's getting more head up about this, various of the Protestant groups started breaking into Catholic churches as iconoclasts, meaning destroying the icons, turning over the altars, getting rid of the Christian symbolism, etc. And there started to be movements on the other side by uh, Catholic mobs trying to, you know, uh, breaking into Protestant churches. It was just ugly. I mean, there was no honor in any of that. Well, at that point, the government asked Prince William of Orange, William of Orange, very important character in the history of Europe, and particularly in the Protestant history of Europe, William of Orange had been a close friend of Charles V, even though William was a Protestant, and Charles was a rabid Catholic. Although Charles, like most rulers, was mostly Catholic because he thought that was inherent in his power. That was part of his power. Well, the government asks William, who's a Protestant and very influential, to stop this violence, to stop the Protestants breaking into churches and destroying them, the iconoclasm and that sort of thing. And so he does so. And William is so respected that when he appeals for a, a, a stop to the violence, they stop. And the iconoclasm part ends, and as a result of that, they declare a truce. You know, they're just ready to go hammer and tongs at each other at war. And because William of Orange steps forward as the leader of the Protestant side and asks for, for peace, they sign a truce um, where there's not going to be any more violence as long as there is toleration. So the Protestants are not going to be tearing up churches if the Catholics let them worship freely. And it's a truce. But this was the point at which Philip said he had no desire to be the Lord of the heretics. And Philip, like other Catholic rulers during the whole Reformation period, they had a policy that said that we have no obligation to fulfill any promises we make to heretics. You know, a heretic gets what they get. And we can tell whatever we want, and we don't have to keep our word to them. God doesn't... God's not going to judge us for that because they're heretics. Who cares what they think? Who cares what we say? So Philip, who had no desire to be the Lord of the heretics, in 1567 raises an army made up of Spanish and Italian soldiers, puts them under the control of the Duke of Alba, and marches into the Low Countries. Now, the Duke of Alba was, whatever else you say about him, he was a brilliant general. He was also horribly cruel. He sets up a, a program, he really takes over the country. The regent, Margaret, the half-sister of Philip, is no longer has it really any power at all. Alba is given authority to do whatever he wants. No limitations, no law. Nobody has recourse to anyone. He has absolute control. He sets up what he calls a court of disturbances, which the Protestants start calling the court of blood. Protestants, who don't immediately recant, are executed. Catholics, who cannot demonstrate that they were actively trying to oppose the Protestants, are executed. Everybody has reason to be afraid of this. Thousands of people are executed. Men, women, and children. The leaders were burned alive. The followers were beheaded. Women were buried alive. Frequently, they would, they were, there were various cities. You know, that These are sort of fortified cities. If they were for the Protestants, <coughs> Alba would approach them, bless you, with his army and say, surrender now and we'll, we'll let you go. They would surrender and he would kill everybody. You know, and again, they felt like we don't have any responsibility to keep our word to heretics. We can do whatever we want. So it was a horrendous time. Now, as a result of that, and in fact, he, um, he arrested a couple of the major leaders and he couldn't get William of Orange. William of Orange had already withdrawn to, to uh, areas he controlled in Germany. So he captures William of Orange's son and holds him, even though he's very young. So at that point, William of Orange decides he has to do something about this. Using his own money, he raises an army. Okay, can you imagine how expensive it is to raise an army? And he invades the Low Country to fight back against Alba, Duke of Alba. Alba beat defeats him at every turn. William of Orange, wonderful guy. <laughs> did not seem to be that great a general, because he gets defeated at every point. And he also, you know, is against the, the resources of the whole nation of Spain, one of the richest countries in Europe, because by this time they're already benefiting from all of the material wealth. And you, you know all those ships that got sunk, you know, in the Caribbean who had, that were loaded with gold? Where do you think that gold was headed? Spain, more than any other single place. So Spain was wealthy. They could afford to put armies out there all day long. But, a very strange thing happens. 
Whereas on land, the beggars, as they were called, the Protestants who were fighting for nationalism under William of Orange now, they can't win anything. But William had given permission to some sailors to become privateers. You know what a privateer is? A privateer is a pirate, but a pirate who's acting under the authority of some government. The English, when they were fighting the Spain, for, uh, fighting against Spain, for instance, before the Spanish Armada and all that, they would have privateers. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, for instance, and others, at various times they, they were privateers, which meant a legally sanctioned pirate by somebody's definition. Okay. Well, William of Orange had told some of these captains that he would, he would sort of sponsor them to be uh, privateers. And they started winning all these battles. In fact, they are just whomping up on the Spanish Navy. And they take control of the sea surrounding the Low Countries. What that means is that even though Alba is winning every battle on land, after a period of time, the beggars of the sea, as they call them, they're controlling the water so much that they can't get food or supplies or pay into the Low Countries for Alba. The Spanish can't get through by sea which means that's how they transported food and all that kind of stuff. So Alba's troops start mutinying because they're not being fed, they're not being supplied, they're not getting what they need. At that point, Alba says, man, I'm tired of this. Can I, can I get a job somewhere else? And the king lets him take another assignment and he sends a different commander in. Now, the other commander comes in and he starts, one of the things, first thing he does is the southern part of the 17 provinces, the Low Countries, were Catholic. He makes promises to the Catholic provinces that they're not going to be bothered and sort of splits them off from the more Protestant north. And so it's sort of a divide and conquer thing. And then he, like Alba had done, he's taking one fortified city at a time. One of the places that after they won almost every battle, one of the last places that the, um, the Protestants were holding out was in the city of Leiden. And we have then the siege of Leiden which was one of the last chances for the Protestants. There's a wonderful quote in one book I read. One of the Protestant defenders of, of Leiden said, uh, tell them that each of us has two arms, and if necessary, we will eat one in order to be able to fight with the other. Okay? <laughs> it's a siege, so they didn't have enough to eat. Well, William of Orange, who was also called William the Sly, or William the Silent, apparently he was a very, you know, very quiet man. Uh, he wasn't looking for all this mess, in other words. But um, William the Silent, William of Orange, he comes up with an idea. And that was that if they opened the dikes at the sea, which is quite a ways away from Leiden, and allow the water to come in, then there won't be any place for the army, you know, the besieging army of the Spanish, it's the Spanish army at this point, to, you know, to maintain the siege. Well, what that meant was destroying years and years, dozens of years of work. Destroying the dikes meant that all of this land that they recovered from the sea, which the Dutch were famous for, of course, all of this would be lost. And yet they were prepared to do it as a last-ditch effort to try to defeat the Spanish army. So they agree with the idea, they break the dikes, it takes four months for the sea in any, in any consequence to reach light. But when it does, along with the sea come the ships, the beggars uh, of the sea ships. Well, the Spanish army has no place to stand. It's now they now be underwater. They have no uh, no support by by ships, and the other guys are there. And they say that the the beggars of the sea, when they showed up, they were one of their cries was they would rather they would rather be Turkish than Popish. Now the Turks <laughs> were the bad guy. The Turks were the boogeyman of Europe. They were the you know they were the guys everybody was afraid of. But these beggars of the sea show up and they're screaming, would rather be Turks than, than Popish, Turkish than Popish. Okay. So, Leiden is saved, they get kind of an equilibrium reestablished, and they continue to go back and forth. Then in 1576, the 17 provinces signed what's called the Pacification of Ghent, which is a treaty where they all agreed, including the Catholic South now, that they all have a stake in national freedom. And the issue is national freedom, not just religion, but the emphasis again on nationalism. There were political goals here. The struggle goes on for years. Neither side seems able to win. It's back and forth. It's so bad that in 1580, another noble act on the part of Philip II, he offers a reward of 25,000 Spanish crowns 
and a title of nobel nobility to anybody that assassinates William Orange, who is absolutely the, the leader. Well, people keep trying, and it takes three years before somebody finally succeeds. And William of Orange is assassinated, and the person that pulled it off, Philip reneged and didn't pay him the money he promised him or give him the title of nobility. I think finally, after after even his friends and family were saying, Philip, you really are a rat. He finally ended up giving half of the money he promised, but not the title of nobility. Um, so he didn't even support his own guys. Then it, it turned out, ironically, that William the Orange's uh, oldest son, Maurice, who was 19, turned out to be a much better general than his father had been. And he launches campaigns at 19 years old and starts winning. And he's winning these battles. About that time, Philip II of Spain dies, just as as the pro Yay. <laughs> um, just as the, the Protestants, the, you know, the nationalists are beginning to win battles and campaigns, Philip dies. There's no longer the pa nobody else has a passion for it like this, and they say, "Why are we doing this? We've been doing this for decades, and it's costing us a fortune. You know, so let's stop." So after Philip's death in 1607, Spain decides it wasn't worth it anymore, and they signed a permanent <laughs> truce. Uh, subsequent to that. The nationalistic movement took hold, and it turned out that the northern provinces, which were almost entirely Protestant at that point, became the nation of the Netherlands. The two, the, the southern groups, because of language differences, uh, became predominantly Catholic nations, Belgium and Luxembourg. But by that time, there's tolerance, so there are Protestants everywhere, and uh, the Netherlands becomes one of the most Protestant countries in the world. Again, the Dutch Reform Movement, based on Calvin's theology, ended up leading to you know, the Christian Reformed Church, the, the Reformed Church in America, you know, the Reformed Church of Canada, all kinds of things. And so, very Protestant. But it came, they had to come through all of this stuff to get there. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah, a map. <laughs> it's never enough, is it? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I don't, but I'll bring one next time. Okay. Sorry. All right, now I want to talk about Protestantism in France, which France, which is even more complicated. <laughs> My wife's from Wisconsin, sometimes I find myself talking like that. Um, sorry. <laughs> okay, the Reformation in France. Now, before the 16th century, which uh, we find in France, actually before, yeah, before the 16th century, um, France was the most unified and centralized monarchy in Europe. I mean, under Francis I and uh, leading up to Francis I, they didn't have a lot of the back and forth. You know, for Germany, with for instance, was broken up into various fiefdoms and dukedoms and princedoms and whatnot. And the, the Low Countries were uh, various bits and pieces of uh, provinces. What we know of as Switzerland was 16 different cantons, like independent states, uh, each of them having their own currency and their own, you know. Europe was not what we think of as Europe, but the most unified and consistent place, probably even more so than Spain, was France. And they seemed to have unity under consistent monarchs. Now, until the Reformation, which it all changed. Now, Francis I, which you've heard about, Francis I, Charles V, you know, back and forth. They were both Catholic, but both of them wanted to be the predominant monarch in Europe. When Charles V, who had been Charles of Spain, became the Holy Roman Emperor, he and Francis were, were, you know, again, hammering tongs at each other all the time. In fact, they went to war several times. Francis got captured at one point, was released on the promise he wouldn't rebel again, and it took him about as long as it took him to get home before he turned around with another army. Okay? So Francis was against Protestantism. He was Catholic, but he saw all the trouble that the Protestants in northern Germany were giving Charles V. And he thought, one of the ways I can get at this guy is by encouraging the Protestants so that he's got a religious problem on his hands in addition to political problems. So Francis is encouraging Protestants in Germany and other areas that Charles V controlled. Well, by doing that, it's not very he wouldn't be very well accepted and listened to by those Protestants if he turned around and persecuted all the Protestants in France, right? And he wanted the, the, the Protestants in other places that under Charles' control to listen to him. So he went kind of light on the Protestants, even though he didn't support Protestantism. But that sort of fluctuated, you know, as, as the political you know, ebb and flow of things, which is always the case. You know, one, you're, you're in exile one year, and the next year you're king again, and then you're, you know, back and forth. 
So there was a fluctuation in terms of how Protestants were treated in France. Not consistent though. Francis would back off when he wanted to try to get some agreement from the Protestants in Germany. Now, this fluctuation meant that there were periods of time when there was persecution, and various of the French Protestants went into exile. For instance, John Calvin. Calvin, who ended up in Geneva, fled persecution in France. He was a French lawyer. You know, you would think those are two things that would be strong marks against him, but he's one of my favorite people. So uh, he ended up leaving, going to Geneva, various other French people. That was a joke. Nobody <laughs> <laughs> must, must have a lot of French people there. <laughs> or lawyers. <laughs> or lawyers. <laughs> um, but various, I mean, Strasbourg had French people there. That's why Protestantism grew there, etc. The French Protestants were called Huguenots, which doesn't mean anything, and I don't think anybody even knows where it came from anymore. But that was the name. Now, it was not, it was not a, a particular group of Protestants. All Protestants were called Huguenots, or which people say Huguenots, but it's Huguenots, in, in France, okay, so I'll use that term. Now, Francis's sister, to give you some idea how things were split up, Francis's sister was Margaret of Anjoulet. She was the queen of Navarre. Navarre is an area in, actually, between France and Spain. It's northern Spain, okay, uh, what we think of as northern Spain. It was an independent kingdom at that time. And she, even though her, she was sister to Francis, who was very Catholic, she was a scholarly woman who had looked at this thing and decided that she supported the, the Protestant Re Reformation. She supported the Reform Movement in her uh, country, in Navarre. She encouraged scholarship there in support of it, and she welcomed Protestants who were fleeing France and other places to come and stay there. And so she is an example of the fact that there was, even amongst family members, there were strong splits between Protestant and Catholic here. Now, in 1547, Francis I died, and again, Francis had been not consistent in terms of his persecution, but his son, Henry II, is much more consistent, and he's much more cruel in his persecution of Protestants. But, fortunately for the Protestants, not too long after he took the throne, Henry did the silly thing of going out to a tournament. They were still having tournaments with jousting and everything then, and he, he died of wounds. He got in a tournament. To me, that's like dying of wounds from a flag football game. But, you know, uh, it, he, it's, you're doing it, it's supposed to be doing it for fun, in other words, and he suffered injuries that killed him. And so he no longer was on the throne after his death. Um, and the next heir was Francis II. Now, the mother of all of these kids was Catherine de' Medici. Recognize that name? Mm -hmm. Of the Italian Medici family. She was very ambitious herself, and she sought to rule through her children. Um, and, of course, Francis I, then Henry II, and Francis II were all old enough to rule everything for themselves. But still, she's involved in politics behind now. She had three, three other sons and a daughter who ended up being monarchs later. Uh, but Catherine is opposed in her political goals, both for her children and for herself, by the House of Guise, which is also called the House of Lorraine, because they came from Lorraine. Guise, you remember when we talked about Scotland, Mary of Guise, married into the Scottish family, and then her daughter, you know, Mary Stuart, ended up being sent to France, where she lived with the house of the family of Guise and was trained. Very Catholic. That's why Mary Stuart was very Catholic, because the family of Guise, or Lorraine, were staunch Catholics, and they had been very prominent in the reign of Henry II, the guy who died from the tournament wounds. In fact, his two primary counselors had been the two oldest uh, brothers of the House of Guise, Francis of Guise and his brother Charles, who was actually an archbishop. They had been counselors to the king. Catherine always felt like their, their counsel was bad, they were bad ideas. And so she did everything she could to oppose them, and in opposing the House of Guise, she was supported by what were called the Princes of the Blood, meaning they were... They were uh, royal relatives. They were first cousins and whatnot of the king. Particularly the House of Bourbon. You've heard of the House of Bourbon? The House of Bourbon were Protestants. So here you got the House of Guise, or Lorraine, very Catholic. You've got Catherine de' Medici, whose goals really are political more than anything else. And you've got relatives of Catherine's, the House of Bourbon, Protestant. House of Guise, Catholic, House of Bourbon, Protestant. 
that line up ends up being the whole outline of what's about to happen in the Reformation in Spain, or in France, excuse me, all right? Now, they're tooling along. When a plot, which was called the Conspiracy of Amboise, was discovered, and the plot was that they were going to kidnap the Bourbons, were actually going to, supposedly, were going to kidnap the king, who had been under the influence of the House of Guise. They were going to kidnap him to get him away from these counselors, get him off somewhere, and convince him, you're listening to the wrong people. Well, <coughs> whatever your reason is, you don't kidnap the king and get away with it. And when they discovered this plot, um, the, it was blamed on the Huguenots, particularly because the Huguenots are the Protestants, because the House of Bourbon, the ones that wanted to get him away from Guise, are the Protestants. They're the, they're the Huguenots. At this point, one of the uh, Bourbon brothers, Louis de Conde, is arrested. And that throws everything into a tizzy, because if you can arrest one of the first cousins of the king, one of the highest levels of nobility in France, <coughs> arrest him and threaten to put him on trial, then who's safe? You know? <coughs> and so all the nobility were saying, hey, we don't think this is a good idea. I don't care what he did. Well, it seems not to have been very healthy to be king of France, because Francis II dies unexpectedly. <laughs> Catherine then, the next heir to the throne, is Charles IX, who's only 10 years old. This is Catherine's chance. She takes over as regent for her son. A regent is somebody who's ruling in the name of somebody, until they get old, usually until they get old enough to rule for themselves. So she takes over as regent. She immediately frees uh, Louis de Condé, and she throws her support behind the Huguenots and the House of Bourbon because they're the ones that are against her enemies, the House of Guise or House of Lorraine. Very political. Catherine basically, like so many of the leaders back then, was motivated by what would get and keep power more than by religious conviction. So, at this point, there are 2,000 Protestant churches in France. This is a pretty big issue. Even for all of the persecution, there has been such a growth of the Protestant movement in France, there are 2,000 churches, of uh, Huguenot churches. Then in 1562, again to stick it to the Catholic House of Guise, or Lorraine, um, Catherine de Medici, the regent, issues an edict, the Edict of Saint-Germain, which gives freedom of worship to the Huguenots with limitations. They were not allowed to create armies, they were not allowed to own property without permission, they were not allowed to build new churches, but within, certain, within the context of limitations, they were given the freedom to worship. Well, this was absolutely, you know, poking the, the Catholic bull with a stick. Catholic bull means something else. But the idea is the Catholics, we're not going to put up with this. The, the regent, Catherine de' Medici, has now given permission to the Protestants to worship freely when they had been trying to get rid of them. Well, what happens is the two Guise brothers, the, 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 who had been the counselors, they get together 200 noblemen. They go to the village of Vassy where they know that the Huguenots are worshipping in a barn. A large crowd of Huguenots, and these 200 noblemen and the two, the Duke of Guise and his brother, um, kill them all, slaughter all of these Huguenots who are unarmed. And that launches the first in a series of eight religious wars between the Huguenots and the Catholics. The word goes out from there that this massacre has happened, so the Protestants, Protestant mobs start attacking Catholic churches, Catholic mobs start slaughtering Christians, until both sides form uh, formal armies. One of the, uh, the, the father of one of the Dukes of Guise, actually he was the Duke of Guise at the time, is the head of the Catholic army. And there is a man named the um, Admiral Gaspar Coligny, who is the head of one of the most respected men in France. And everybody to this day, all of the historians say, it doesn't matter which side you're on, he was the most honorable. And, and respected person from either side. He becomes the head of the Protestant armies. Well, very shortly after the, this war starts, the, the Duke of Guise is killed. And his sons believe that it was, he was killed um, dishonorably by Coligny, the head of the, of the Protestant army. And so there's this, this anger and this desire for revenge that's going on. Well, they have a series of temporary truces that occur. But after the first, the first war, there's a truce. And then that gets broken. In, in another uh, war starts in 1567, there's a truce for that one, it gets broken, there's another truce in 1570, and they, have, they, uh, they keep going back and forth, they'll have a truce for a while and they'll have war, and then we have what's called the Massacre 
of St. Bartholomew's Day. You know that game. Okay. So, 1571, Henry, now the Duke of Guise, whose father had been the head of Catholic armies who got killed, he blamed Admiral Gaspar Coligny, the leader of the Protestant armies, for having had his father killed. He thought that it was an assassination. There's no indication historically that that's true. Well, they're at peace now. There's a truce going on. But that doesn't change the fact that Henry of Guise wants revenge against Admiral Coligny, who was the head of the Protestants. So, all the Huguenots and all the Catholic leaders, thinking they're at peace, are invited to Paris for the wedding of Henry Beaumont to the sister of the king, Charles IX. Okay, so Protestant, this is how, how well they thought they were doing. Henry of Bourbon was of the Protestant family of Bourbon. He's marrying the sister of Charles IX, who technically is Catholic, even though Catherine de Medici, his mother, had been kind of supporting the Protestants. Well, while they're there, someone tries to shoot Admiral Coligny from uh, one of the buildings as he's walking along parade ground. They blow off part of his hand and wound him in the arm, but he survives. The king, who's a young king, but he's, you know, he's getting up there, he's in his teens now, he starts looking into this and decides that the House of Guise, he was shot from apartments uh, where the House of Guise were staying, and he rode away on a horse <coughs> from his mother's stable. Because apparently Catherine, who was starting to get scared of Protestant power, even though she'd been supporting them, and the, uh, she'd actually gotten together with the Guise folks and decided we've got to do something about this. They try to assassinate Coligny. When that doesn't work, a few days later, Catherine de' Medici convinces her son, Charles IX, that the Huguenots are involved in a plot to overthrow him. So she's turning against the Protestants now. And she convinces him that's true. So on the night of August 23rd, 1570, the king agrees, and the regent, she's technically still regent, the, the regent Catherine agree, that they are going to take drastic action against the Huguenots. The next day is August 24th, which is St. Bartholomew's Day. On St. Bartholomew's Day, with the approval of Catherine and Charles IX, the Catholics under the Duke of Guise attack and kill over 2,000 Huguenots in Paris, and they launch a nationwide sweep that leads to tens of thousands of victims. Even a lot of the Catholics were appalled by this. Um, and and the, the stories, like um, Coligny is in bed recovering from his wounds, they break into his apartment, they beat him, they throw him out the window alive, and on the ground out from, from a multi-story uh, room, the Duke of Guise, Henry of Guise, is down below, and he wants revenge, so he kicks Coligny to death. They then mutilate his body and hang him up for viewing. Very unpleasant. This St. Bartholomew's Day massacre, massacre um, resonated all over Europe, either positive or negative. Uh, most people were so appalled by it. The Queen, of, uh, Queen Elizabeth, for instance, uh, announced a day of mourning for it. And yet, the Pope at that time um, called for a, a Te Deum, which is a celebration of Thanksgiving, to be, uh, to be played, and, and said that that should be done every year on that date in celebration. Okay? Um, very different kind of responses. But one of the things that's happening here in the Low Countries, for instance, this is the same time that William of Orange is trying to march back into the Low Countries to do battle, and the army that he has is made up predominantly of French mercenaries. Well, when he gets word of this massacre against the Protestant Huguenots, he's not going to keep a French army, you know, to, to go in and fight against the Catholics. So he disbands the whole thing, sends them all home, and uh, that extends the period of, of war in, in the Low Country because of this. Again, this had ramifications everywhere in terms of how people responded to it. Um, but for all of that, and the fact that it's, it went out from there, it wasn't just a one-day thing. It started persecution, and that's why tens of thousands were killed. But Protestantism was not stamped out. One of the things that had happened under one of the earlier edicts of uh, toleration under Catherine was she had given several fortified cities, including especially La Rochelle, was given to the uh, Huguenots as a sort of token of, you know, we're not going to hurt you, and just to show you that, we'll let you, we'll give you something to help you protect yourselves. Well, La Rochelle and one other fortified city were so powerful, the Catholics were unable to, to break into them. And so the Huguenots continued to hold out. Then, Charles IX dies. 
I began to wonder, okay, who is the cook um, for all of this? Yes? On the, on the previous slide, if, could you go down? Uh, it says that, that uh, Protestant moms attacked the Catholic churches, the Catholic moms slaughtered the Christians. Right. Are they saying the Catholic Well, I'm sorry, that should say Protestants. Catholics were slaughtered Protestants. Oh, instead of Christians? Yeah. Oh, okay. <coughs> Sorry, here, just here um, in Mexico, it appears that there is a thought that that Christians and Catholics are are different. Well, that's just the terminology here. In order to differentiate from Catholic, Protestants are called Christians. In fact, when we when uh, Guillermo and I offer communion, we tell people that if you've been baptized, as a, whether it's a child or as an adult, and whether in a Catholic church or a Christian church, because that's how people understand it. Okay. Yeah, but no, that's that's just a mistake. That shouldn't say slaughtered Protestants. Okay. Um, then, after Charles the Ninth died, his next brother, who becomes Henry the Third, had Catherine de Medici, ambitious for her children, had gotten him named the King of Poland. I still don't know how all this stuff works. He's the King of Poland, and when they send him word that the throne of France is now vacant, he you know, jumps on his horse and rides back to France <laughs> without even bothering to abdicate his kingship in Poland. I'm sure the nobles, the royalty in Poland, showed up the next day and went, where's, he? where's Henry? <laughs> oh, he's in France. He's not king here anymore, you know. So he goes back in order, because it was much more of a plum to be the, you know, the king of France than it was to be the king of Poland. Sorry, Barbara. Okay. <laughs> um, this is just historical. It's not personal. Um, and... When he gets back, he sees that it's in his interest to establish peace. This warring back and forth isn't going to help him. So he gives freedom of worship again to the Protestants, and that sets off the Catholics again. Okay, um, the this should be geese Catholics, not guide Catholics. Uh, they declare another war, which is the eighth in the series of these religious wars between the Huguenots and the Catholics, um, and they. Um, you know, they launch attacks, the House of Guise does. Eventually, Henry decides, okay, they've got the upper hand, so I'm going to join them. So, Henry changes his religious affiliation five times. <laughs> this process. Because at the, at the, remember, he was getting ready to, this is, this is, uh, he was getting ready to get married during the, the uh, massacre of St. Bartholomew. Well, they grabbed him, since he was a Huguenot, a, a Protestant, and they drag him before the king, and he recants his religion. He becomes Catholic. He'd gone back and forth and back and forth. Well, here he comes back and he provides support <clears throat> for the Protestants at first. Then he realizes that they're losing, and so he gets, starts supporting the Catholics again. Um, but Henry III had no heir. And the next in line, I'm sorry, I called him Henry Bourbon a minute ago. This is a different Henry. Um, Henry III had no heir. The next in line for the throne was Henry Bourbon, who was Protestant. Henry Bourbon being Protestant, was not acceptable to the Catholics. They were not going to take that, having a Catholic or a Protestant king. So, the Catholic group then, the House of Guise especially, they produce an ancient document, which claimed that Henry of Guise, the whole House of Guise, was descended directly from Charlemagne, and so they had a right to the throne, a claim to the throne of France that superseded any other uh, claim that anybody could have. Uh, including Henry of Bourbon. This is similar to the fact that when, when the Pope um, wanted to gain, to claim authority, uh, they came up with a document that said Constantine had given the authority over the whole church to the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. Uh, this is the, called the Donation of Charlemagne, and complete falsehood. This was a complete, they made this up, okay? Well, because he now has this document, Guise claims that he is the king. He marches into Paris, conquers Paris, declares himself the king, and so Henry III, who was still there, still in the city, even though Henry uh, the, the uh, Henry of Guise, there are three Henrys here, this is Henry of Guise, comes in, tells Henry III, you're not king anymore, I'm king now. Well, Henry III had learned the lesson 16 years earlier at the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day. So two days before Christmas in 1588, he does the same thing to uh, Henry of Guise. He gets all his guys together, and in one night, they kill Henry of Guise, they kill all of his followers, you know, they have another massacre. Only this time, you know, it's, it's the king who's doing it against this 
this pretender king. So he's back in charge. But this Henry, Henry III, was a lousy king. He really was over his head. He didn't know what he was doing. And so the, the Catholics come back in. They fight back into the city. Henry, Henry III, the king, has to flee Paris. Well, the only place he can go where anybody has an army that can protect him is Henry of Bourbon, the third Henry. So the Henry of Guise claimed to be king because of his ancient document. He gets killed. Henry III, who was technically the king right then, is incompetent. And when the Catholics march in, he runs for it. And the only place he can run is to the third Henry, who's Henry of Bourbon, who's a Protestant, who had a rightful claim to the throne after Henry III died. Okay? Now, Henry, the, Henry Bourbon welcomes the king, Henry III, graciously, and he treats him like a king, but he won't let him give commands. I mean, he won't, he won't say, here's, your army's not going to go fight for me or anything, but he does treat him graciously, sort of like what Elizabeth did with Mary Stuart, you know, came down to England for protection. But while he is in the camp of Henry Bourbon, a fanatical Dominican monk believes that he was a heretic and uh, the wrong guy, he, he'd been an awful king, and so therefore it was legal to kill him. So he sneaks in and kills Henry III as a tyrant. So Henry of Guise is dead at the hands of Henry III. Henry III, who was king, technically, um, is killed by a Dominican monk. That only leaves Henry Bourbon, who then is the rightful claimant to the throne. He, Protestant, becomes King Henry IV, and he fends off assaults at that point from Philip II. Okay. Now, the who said, I'm Catholic, you're Protestant, I have a right to that, I'm going to take it over. Well, he fends it off, and then he changes his religion again, back to Catholic. Uh, and in fact, he's quoted at that point of saying, Paris is worth a mass. <laughs> so, he converts back to Catholicism, but he is so tolerant toward Protestants that he's accused of being a closet Protestant. In 1598, um, Henry IV grants complete religious freedom of worship in the Edict of Nantes, uh, or Nantes, I guess it is, and um, he ends up being a pretty decent ruler, unlike his predecessor, uh, III, until 1610, at which point a Catholic fanatic who was completely convinced that he was still Protestant sneaks in and kills him. Okay. Um, yeah, good reason not to be a king. Okay, they say it's good to be king, not so much. All right. Well, at that point, because um, even though Henry is dead, the declaration he made in the Edict of Nantes does give religious freedom, and that is not revoked. And so you have the Huguenots get reestablished. There is a large, well, actually, they've been persecuted pretty heavily, but Protestantism is established. More Protestant missionaries come in from elsewhere, and Protestantism becomes uh, an important part. Now, now, France still remained predominantly Catholic after that, but there's still, there was a presence of a significant Protestant. I mean, you, don't, you only have to go to Paris to realize that France remained Catholic. What are some of the famous buildings there? Churches. Cathedrals, okay, they're major churches. Uh, Notre Dame and Chartres and various others. So, okay, um, we're going to take a break. All right, let's talk about the Catholic Reformation. <laughs> uh, the Protestants would tend to think that Reformation was something that, that the Protestants started, and it's not. The Reformation, in terms of Reformation of the Church, was well along and well established in many parts of Europe prior to Luther or St. Lee or the start of the Protestant Reformation. But there's a fundamental difference there. Um, Luther and St. Lee and Calvin and others, their Reformation was significantly a Reformation of doctrine, the beliefs of the Church. Prior to the Protestant Reformation, there was a huge move, and it had been on and off for <coughs> centuries, to reform the Catholic Church, but to reform it not doctrinally, but ethically, morally. The idea that they had so many problems with nepotism, okay, um, and I'm talking about an extreme example of that, well, I'll tell you right now, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. Isabella was very much in favor of reform because she really wanted the church to be better. And so she wanted to reform the morals and the ethics of the church. Well, Ferdinand, her husband, and they had, they had ruled you know, <clears throat> neighboring kingdoms before they got married and you know, became the king and queen of Spain. Um, they, Ferdinand also wanted reform, but that's because he wanted more power because he saw the ability of the local monarch to be able to make decisions as being very important. He was not in favor of ethical reform, and to demonstrate that, 
Um, at one point, he appointed his illegitimate six-year-old son as archbishop of the most important see in his kingdom. Six-year-old illegitimate son, archbishop. Ferdinand was not very interested in moral, you know, moral uh, reformation, but Isabella was. Okay, now let's talk about that. In Spain, particularly, Spain being for most of the time the most um, the most Catholic of all the countries in uh, in Europe. Spain was the place where the Inquisition was most severe because they took it that seriously. Spain was the place where the Pope tended to give them more latitude because he didn't really fear that the Spanish were going to move away from the Catholic faith. Okay? The Spanish are the reason why this is a Catholic country, as is most of Latin America, because the, the Spanish conquered more of these areas than any place else, and they, they instituted the Spanish Catholic form of religion here. So. Isabella inherited the crown of Castile, one of the uh, it's sort of one of the states of Spain now, but it was an independent uh, monarchy at that point. In 1474, she was a very religious person, and she really saw that the, the church in Castile, where she was the ruler, really needed reformation for a lot of reasons. Some of the, the uh, prelates, the, the church leaders, bishops and archbishops and whatnot, had become great lords with great amounts of property and great wealth, and they wanted to hang on to that, and they would do whatever they could to hang on to that. On the other hand, we had, uh, they had clergy that were completely untrained. Up to that point, there was no set program for training clergy. You had clergy that were virtually illiterate, uh, because some bishop laid hands on them and made them a minister. The Catholic Church at that point did not have standard requirements for what you had to go through in terms of education to become a priest or a monk or anything else. Um, and monasticism in Spain was at a very low ebb. This is one of the places where the monasteries had become like fraternity houses or, or social clubs. It was like the country club. You go there for a really good dinner and a dance on Saturday night. And there was not a sense of there being a spiritual commitment. Um, in fact, the monasteries tended to be kind of country clubs where the illegitimate children of, of priests and, and monks and bishops and nobility would go, you know. It was, it was a summer camp for illegitimate kids from people who shouldn't have been having kids in the first place. So it was a pretty bad situation. And so Isabella started out by getting permission from the Pope to take responsibility and, and the ability to name her own ecclesiastical uh, leaders, her own priests, her own bishops. And again, the Pope at that point, because Spain was very powerful and very Catholic, the Pope wanted to keep them happy, but he also knew that it was less likelihood that Spain was going to go in the wrong direction if he gave them more latitude than other countries. All right? So, first she got that right because she wanted to reform the church, and then her husband Ferdinand, who was the king of neighboring Aragon before they married, Castile and Aragon, Isabella and Ferdinand, they married and became the joint rulers of Spain. Um, uh, Ferdinand was interested in, in, he got the same permission from the Pope, but he primarily was interested in the power they gave him. And again, his morality was, he appointed his illegitimate six-year-old son as the Archbishop of Saragossa, which was the capital city, you know. Uh, so, very different ideas there, but still both of them were, you know, took authority within their kingdoms. Now, Isabella's confessor was a man, man named Francisco Jimenez de Cisneros. Um, confessor meant his, her private priest, the one since she was the queen, the one who would hear her confession, would provide mass for her, was basically there to take care of her spiritual needs. And he was a Franciscan uh, monk, known for his austerity. He actually had spent 10 years in prison for refusing to participate in what he saw as corrupt practices in the Catholic Church. The Pope had thrown him to prison for 10 years because he wouldn't go along with the, with the program change of popes, he got out. He becomes, uh, and, and while he was in prison, the 10 years he spent in prison, he was very scholarly. He studied Hebrew and Chaldean, which is Aramaic, right? the language that Jesus probably spoke. He uh, really focused himself on learning, which was really rare. Again, you had priests and monks who were virtually illiterate. He became a man of great learning, and when he got out, the, the Bishop of Toledo, who also was a reformist, recommended him to um, Isabella as her confessor. He became her confessor, and then later on, she 
um, advocated that he, when there was a new pope, Alexander VI, and she advocated that he be committed to be the leader of the Catholic Church in Spain. And Jimenez Cisneros at first said, no, I'm not going to do that. She actually had to get the pope to send a papal bull to order him to do this, because he was a fairly, early on, he was a fairly humble, modest guy. I think he continued to be, but he's still very rigorous. Well, the queen and her confessor then start out to, and he'd been made the Archbishop, Archbishop of Toledo after the Archbishop of Toledo died. They start out reforming the convents and the monasteries. They personally visited all of the major monasteries in the area of control they had, which at this point was Aragon and Castile. Um, they got rid of monks and abbots who refused to go along with the program. They chastised others who were not uh, enough with the program. They completely renovated the whole monastic movement in Spain and made it a very serious endeavor. Now, so much so that a lot of the people in the monasteries of Spain appealed to the Pope and said, can you stop her? Yeah. You know, it's killing us. And the Pope said, you know, I, there are reasons I need to support this lady. Because even though she's more rigorous than the Pope wanted to be, there were political reasons why he wanted to humor her, even though she was strong reformist. Now, at that point, Jimenez says that her, her confessor, his scholarship, kicked in in terms of his interest in scripture. Because he now was the, the primary religious figure in Spain, he did several things. One, he created the University of Alcala. The University of Alcala became the prominent uh, university in Spain with students, alumni like Cervantes, uh, like um, uh, Loyola, um, you know, Ignatius of Loyola, and others. It became the most important university in that part of Europe. And it was founded by Jimenez. And Jimenez also, the other thing he did was, because of his scholarship, he strongly advocated reading of scripture. In fact, he was quoted at this time, this is before Luther, saying something that later on Luther would get declared a heretic for. Jimenez said that uh, he produced an issue, an issue of the Bible called the Complutensian Polyglot. It was basically a parallel Bible using new translations that he had commissioned from scholars of in Latin, in Greek, in Hebrew, in the ancient languages, okay, throughout the Old and New Testament. It was published in six volumes, four volumes of the Old Testament, one volume in the New Testament, and one volume which was a grammar of all the languages that had been used. Very important scholarly work. Well, when that was published, Jimenez was quoted saying, this edition of the Bible that at this critical time opens the sacred sources of our religion from which will flow a much purer theology than any derived from less direct sources. In other words, he advocated scripture as being the authority for our faith, which later the Council of Trent would officially deny, and which is still the official doctrine of the Catholic Church. But that had not happened yet, and so he gets away with it. Okay. Um, so, Despite the fact that Jimenez was a scholar and believed in scripture, and he even advocated that people be able to re read scripture for themselves, which was really radical for a Catholic in that day, still that did not mean he was tolerant toward people who were not Catholic. He um, actually was named Grand Inquisitor in Spain. He wanted to reform the customs and the morals, but again, remember, the, the Catholic Reformation was not a reformation of doctrine. They held, they held the line in terms of Catholic doctrine. They wanted to be more moral and more spiritual, more upright, but stay with the doctrine. And so he was the one responsible not only for trying to reform under Isabella the moral issues, but to maintain the discipline of the Catholic doctrine. And for that reason, he became the Inquisitor in Spain. Now, this is after the worst times of the Inquisition in Spain. I mean, they had bad times after that as well. But... Um, one of the things that, that comes along at this time, now all of this is happening before Protestantism. Protestantism comes along, and all of a sudden, there's a different understanding of what Reformation has to be. All of a sudden, um, Protestantism gave Catholic Reformation a focus doctrinally, as well as the moral Reformation they were trying for. What that means is, all of a sudden, there were doctrines that had to be refuted. And so you come to a time where Catholic Reformation began to focus more, more on uh, polemics against Protestant doctrine than on trying to morally reform the Catholic Church. 
okay? But it's still considered part of the Catholic Reformation. Um, <coughs> some of the Catholic leaders that come along after the Protestant Reformation starts are very powerful scholars, very strong scholars. They, they come into it, you get people like John Eck, who was, if you remember the Luther lecture, John Eck was the one who, lect, who uh, debated against Luther in Karlstadt at Leipzig. Uh, he was a conscientious pastor, and interestingly enough, even though he was the one who argued for the Catholic faith against Luther, remember Luther wrote a German translation of the Bible, well, in 1537, 20 years after Wittenberg Cathedral, uh, John Eck published his own German translation of the Bible. So even he was pushing for people to be able to read the Bible in their own language, as Catholic as he was, and as much as he defended the Catholic faith against Luther. You also get, um, there was a, a professor at the University of Louvain, James uh, Latimus, who argued that all you needed to understand Scripture was the Latin Vulgate. You didn't need the original languages. In fact, he said that it was a hindrance, worse than useless, to study the original languages, Greek and Hebrew, and that it was to be the job of the church. And in this way, he was advocating the traditional uh, Orthodox Catholic view. The church was responsible for, for interpreting for you. So if you can read Latin, that's fine. You can read it. You don't need Greek. You don't need Hebrew. You don't need it in German. And if you've got a question about what it means, that's what the church is for. Okay? That was the very traditional. Now, along this time, however, two great scholars come along in the Catholic side. One is Robert Bellarmine. Heard the name Bellarmine, or Bellarmine, it looks like. There's a Bellarmine University, for instance, Catholic University. And also a man named Caesar Baronius, who was a historian. Well, Bellarmine became the chief systematizer of the Catholic doctrine against Protestantism. In other words, he took all of the Protestant theology and statements and doctrine, and he formulated the official response of the Catholic Church theologically to that. Um, he actually, in Rome, was made the, was, was given the chair, which is professorship. He was made the chair of polemics in Rome. Polemics is, is to argue against something. Okay? And so that was his whole job, and he was very good at it. In fact, Bellarmine's work, he wrote a, a, his, his magnum opus, his great book, was called On the Controversy of the Christian Faith, which he published in 1593. That book and Bellarmine's arguments are still today used by the Catholic Church in refutation of Protestant doctrine. So Bellarmine, you know, 400 years ago, uh, established the arguments which have remained since that time as the refutation the Catholics use against Protestantism. Now there are a lot of other things happen, like Council of Trent and that sort of thing. But um, it's interesting that Bellarmine was one of the uh, to to this isn't we would not think of this as being a star in, on his, in his crown. But he was one of the people who um, met with Galileo, and one of the people that was responsible for declaring that Galileo's notion that the earth moved around the sun instead of the other way around, that that, that was heretical. So mm -hmm. Bellarmine was one of the Catholic theologians that you know, uh, condemned Galileo. Um, so he wasn't right about all this stuff. Yes, Joanne. So the, um, the Catholics against the Protestants, was, was this more of a scholarly level, or was it also at the layman level? Well, it was no. It was it was probably more at the lay level than anything else. I mean, you had armies going in and killing heretics at the by the by the command of either the pope or the Catholic monarchs. So it affected everybody. But while you're doing that, the church said, "Well, somebody's got to be developing the justification for the persecution of heretics." And I don't mean that necessarily in a, in a derogatory way. Um, they believe what you're saying is not true to the Catholic faith. But then they needed very specific kinds of explanations for what about it is wrong. Why is it wrong? What, what from our history tells us it's wrong, etc. And that's what people like uh, Bellman and Baronius were responsible for. Is that still very true today? Which is true today? Uh, well, the, the, the big argument, you know, the, uh, kind of the fight back and forth, is it mm -hmm. more of a scholarly level in today's world? Yeah, I mean, like, the, there are late differences. For instance, you know, I don't see Samuel. Is he not here? Uh, when Samuel became a Christian, joined our church, and I baptized him, his mother-in-law threw him and his wife out. Okay, um, that that happens today. So there is a very, very you know, uh, common person level. There is still very strong feelings, especially Mexico is the most Catholic country in the world. 
in terms of the, number, the percentage of the population that adhere to the Catholic faith. Um, and so there are very strong feelings. You know, a lot of Catholics would say that, you know, we're, we're not only heretics, we're misleading people, you know, and, and taking them away from, we, we have other people whose uh, gringos who are married in Mexican families, and, you know, the question that their, their in-laws always have is, well, don't you pray to the Virgin Mary? Because if you don't, then there's something wrong. Okay? You can't really be a Christian if you don't pray to Mary. And so there's very lay-level kind of things. But there also are scholarly disagreements. Actually, there's probably less, uh, less heat at the scholarly level now than at the lay level. Okay? Along those same lines, uh, Jose Curiel, the Wildland director, when I first moved here, stated that this area, area of Mexico is the least Protestant area of all of Latin America. Okay, give us a few years. He said, <laughs> that, was, that was 13 years ago. Okay. At that time, it was less than 1%. So, but the other thing is we forget that the religions were tied up with the rulers and the governments of the country. They were, And so we, we just had a whole hard time th thinking in that mind frame you know, that that's what this situation in this time period is. Yeah, like. I mean, this is a Catholic nation because... Yeah. And, Spanish, and they speak Spanish because Spain came in here and said, you speak our language and this is our religion and it's now your religion. Okay. Pretty much as simple as that. Okay. It's a little more complicated, but you know, that's, that's the basis of it. And so, and it became part of their culture. And that's the issue, is it is a, it's not just a religious issue, it's not a matter of conviction. In, in, in so many of these conversations, we talk about church history, I keep saying that there were political motivations that were as strong and as, as much a part of this as the religious convictions. So there always are other human motivations here, whether they're political, if you're a ruler and you want to make sure that you've got control of things, or cultural, where people say, uh, you know, a great many Mexican people would say, you can't really be a Mexican if you're not Catholic. And understand, I'm not being critical of that, I'm saying that's just a fact. You know, if you if you deny Catholicism, then you're you're denying your heritage. You're denying your cultural heritage, and how can you be Mexican if you do that? Well, there are other countries where that's very true as well. Um, probably more so here than anywhere, because as I say, this is considered the most Catholic country in the world. But that same mixture of human motivations has always been true throughout the history of the church. <coughs> it's never as clean as do you believe this or do you believe this. Okay. There's a lot of other things that come. But there were scholarly, you know, the, the scholars come along sort of after the fact because the church says we need, and, and they were motivated by this. They're Catholic scholars, and they hear things they don't they don't agree with, and you know, a scholar the first thing they want to do is write a paper explaining why that's wrong, <laughs> and so that's what they would do, um, and that's what we find. Now, I mentioned uh, Bellarmine; he was one of the great systematizers of the Catholic faith in response to Protestantism, and then you have Caesar Baronius. Baronius was a, a Catholic historian at the University of Magdeburg. And he put together history of faith in ways that supported the, the Catholic doctrine and, and denounced or argued against the Protestant approach. And you have to realize that you know, when this was happening in the 1500s, it wasn't for more than 100 years later. 1696, there's a historian named Gottfried Arnold. Uh, no, no, no relation, I don't think. Actually, his name is Gortfried. But um, he wrote two books in the late 1600s um, called True Picture of the First Christians and A Nonpartisan History of the Church and, and of Heretics. Those are the first books ever written that could, could legitimately be called objective. Everything prior to that, historically, historically objective. Everything prior to that had been written from one slant or the other, had been written to try to defend Catholicism against Protestantism or Lutheranism against Calvinism or everybody against the Anabaptists or whatever it was. Okay? Um, there had not been any objective histories. And uh, Gottfried Arnold in the late 1600s was the first one that we can look at and say he really was being fair, he was really being objective. They didn't see that as part of their job before that. And so Baronius was a, was a significant historian, but he wrote in defense of the Catholic view. And his stuff, we would read it and think, well, that's not fair. Well, he didn't have the same objectives. That's like uh, in the United States. I, I, I was a journalist, small-town newspaper journalist for a little bit, and so I studied journalism and whatnot. 
we have this principle in the United States that any newspaper is supposed to be objective. Okay? Well, we don't think that as much anymore, but up until about 20 years ago, back when I was doing this, that it's supposed to be, and if it's not objective, it was called yellow journalism. In Britain, newspapers plainly say that they are a liberal newspaper, meaning a liberal party, not, not liberal in terms of you know, you know, liberal conservative, but they are part of the liberal party, or they're a Tory newspaper, you know, conservative, or they're whatever. <laughs> and the publications tell you right up front, this is, this is where we are. Now we have things like Fox, who sort of try to hide it. They say we're being objective, and they're not, okay? Um, and, and, or whatever. Magazines, newspapers, TV outlets, we don't have objectivity anymore. But we still pretend we do. Well, they didn't pretend back then. You know, Baronius, in writing his histories, would say, this is in defense of the Catholic view. And that's how it comes out, okay? All right. Yes. These dates, names, and all. Do you have a? Uh, I don't. It's not up here. I expect you to remember this. <laughs> um, the stuff that you need to know, and I'm sorry I don't have that up here. The things that you you need to know, I will have it on the study sheets, which will be coming out in the next week or two. Okay, so you'll have the details on that. Sorry about that. Uh, or you can go back and memorize it from the video. Okay. Now, at this point, one of the things the Catholic Church did toward Reformation is they, they both strengthened some of the monastic orders and religious orders that had existed. And, and a religious order is, is like a, it's like the Franciscans or the Dominicans or the, you know, whatever. The, the, and so they both strengthened some of the traditional orders, and they created some new orders. In particular, two new orders were founded that became very important. One, the first one is the Decalcid Carmelites which was founded by Teresa of Avila. Decalcid means barefoot, because the, the, the nuns who were decalcid um, Carmelites wore sandals instead of closed shoes. And they became known to differentiate them from other, other kinds of uh, Carmelite nuns. Now, St. Teresa, uh, oh, and the other order I should mention were the Jesuits, uh, which were founded along this time by Ignatia of Loyola, who had been a graduate of the University of Jimenez. Isabel's confessor found it, okay? So, um, first let's talk about Teresa. Teresa of Avila. Avila is in Spain. It's, it's on the plateau of Castile. She had joined the Carmelite convent um, as a young woman and against her father's will and because neither he nor people who knew her saw her as a nun. She was renowned for her wit and her charm. She's apparently so charming that it became very popular for aristocrats to go out to the monastery just to talk to her. That was a fad, because she was thought to be so cool. Um, and, and she was very funny. For instance, later on, uh, she meets John of the Cross, who became Saint John of the Cross, and he, they became friends and collaborators, and actually she founded the, the, uh, the monastic order for women, and then with his help, being male, so there's certain things she couldn't do in terms of monastic order. They launched a male, you know, uh, monastic order related to that, and she's the only woman ever to be seen responsible for a male and female monastic order. Well, she did it with the help of John of the Cross. Well, John of the Cross was apparently a very, very short man, and the story was that when she first met him, she said, "I have been praying to God to send me a monk, but He only sent me half a monk." <laughs> so she apparently was a charmer. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> she's, she loved to read. She took all the opportunity she could to read books of devotion, and she was shocked, horrified, when the Inquisition in Spain came out with a list of books that were uh, forbidden that included most of her favorites. <laughs> and so she was really upset about that, and she prayed about it and prayed about it, and she had a vision from Jesus saying, I will be your book. Um, and so she focused on that. She started at this point having visions where she would, you know, Jesus would speak to her. And she was troubled by this because she said, I can't, I don't know for sure if this is from God or maybe from a demon. And she was troubled and her confessors did not help her along the way. Finally, she met some monks, friars, who were able to give her good counsel. And she came to the decision that these were genuine, they were from God. And... Her visions told Teresa to leave the convent, where she was still a very young, you know, nun. Uh, leave the convent, found another monastic uh, convent nearby for women, 
And everybody told her you can't do that. You know, the mother abbot told her you can't do that. The uh, authorities of the church told her you can't do that. And she said, God's telling me to do this. And so I'm going to do it. So against all opposition, she succeeded. She starts this small convent, starts monastic order, and everybody went, well, that's amazing you did that. And she said, oh, but now God has told me he wants me to start these all over Spain and maybe the rest of Europe. So she started planting these monasteries along the lot, along the way. She met John of the Cross, who became Saint John of the Cross, um, and he helped her with the organization of all of that. And this order spread throughout Spain, throughout the various Spanish possessions, and into some other outlying areas as well. And they became known as the Decalcid or Barefoot Carmelites. The focus is um, is disciplined spirituality. She continued throughout her life to have visions, and she encouraged the kind of spirituality where there was a very personal kind of relationship with God in a mystical sort of union. Um, she wrote some classics of devotional literature. In 1970, Pope Paul VI uh, named Teresa as one of the doctors of the church, which means one of the people that God inspired to produce uh, significant teaching for the church. There's only two women that have ever been named doctors of the church, Teresa of Avila and Catherine of Siena. And St. John of the Cross, who was later made a saint, as was Teresa, um, he also is considered a doctor of the church for the work that he did. So this movement, very significant in terms of taking a Catholic spirituality out. We also then have St. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the um, Jesuits. Uh, uh, Loyola started out from an aristocratic family. He was a soldier. He fought in battles. He was severely wounded in the siege of Pamplona in Navarre. It was a religious war. He was wounded so badly he limped for the rest of his life. Well, while he was laid up in great pain, they didn't have a whole lot of Darvon and stuff back then. <laughs> when he was laid up and in pain and disappointed and, and you know he's not going to be able to be a soldier anymore and he thinks his life is over, he too had a vision. He had a vision of what he said was the image of Our Lady with the Holy Child, Jesus, giving me remarkable consolation. After that, he made a pilgrimage to the monastery of Montserrat, and he devoted himself to serving the, the lady, uh, his lady, the virgin. He confessed his sins, and he withdrew to become, he thought, to become a, a hermit. But he very quickly figured out that wasn't for him. He struggled a great deal, as Luther did. There's amazing parallels in terms of their spiritual uh, battles or travels between Luther and Ignatius of Loyola. You know, opposite theologically in many ways, of course. But like Luther, Loyola was tormented by his sin, the sense he had of his own sin and a desire for the grace of God. Now, unlike Luther, Loyola does not go into a lot of detail in terms of how he got over that, but he does say that there came a time when he really felt that God uh, gave him his mercy and freed him from a sense of obligation for his sins. And at that point, he devoted his whole life to service of the church, and especially he felt motivated to serve the Pope, specifically. And as part of that process, he wanted to be a missionary. He wanted to go to the, the Holy Lands, be a missionary to the Turks, but he went to eastern, eastern, the eastern borders of the Holy Roman Empire in order to be close to the Turks. The Franciscans were already there, you know, got to know him a little bit. They went, no, 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 you don't belong here. You know, you go home. And here the Franciscans were trying to take kind of a level head. He was this fiery Spaniard. He wanted to, you know, let's go get him, guys, you know. And they said, no, you're not, this isn't going to work. So they sent him home, and after much prayer, much a discussion with other people, he decided he had to go back to school. Now, he's, a, he's an adult male at this point, an adult man, but he goes back to school alongside college-age kids at the universities of Barcelona, of Alcala, which I told you, you know, that's, that's where Jimenez started, of Salamanca, and of Paris. He studied enthusiastically, he learned a great deal. In 1534, because he was such a student and he had a great spirituality, other students started hanging around him. He started to have his own group. And they would listen to him, he would teach them, etc. Well, in 1534, he goes back to Montserrat, where he had been a monk, and all these guys go with him. And they, that little band of people <clears throat> vow together vows of poverty, of chastity, and of obedience to the Pope. That becomes the start of the Jesuit movement. In 1540, 
Pope Paul III approved the new Society of Jesus, which is the technical name for the Jesuits, and they became one of the main instruments of Catholic opposition to Protestantism. The Jesuits, everywhere they went, they were, uh, they were known for their academics, scholarship, their Jesuit universities. You know, in Seattle, there's the, the, uh, the Seattle University is a Jesuit school. They were well known for their academics. They were known for their missionary zeal. Jesuits led a lot of the, the, the first missionary efforts to the Far East and to the New World. Um, the, but more than anything else, they were the ones the Pope could call on when there was a crisis situation and he needed somebody to go deal with it. They were structured, because of Loyola's background, they were structured like a military unit. He was the general. They still refer to the head of the Jesuit order as being the general. So very military, and very military in terms of their ability to respond to situations that the Pope called them on, rapidly, efficiently, uh, to deal with challenges, opportunities, and with scholarship, with enthusiasm, and with absolute dedication to the Pope. Okay? That's the Jesuits. They were very significant. We also need to recognize during this time that there was there was there were various times where there was papal reformation or at least attempts at it, meaning to reform the papacy. Um, when, Luther, when Luther nailed the theses to the Wittenberg door, the pope at that time was Leo X. Leo X was one of the popes that was most interested in embellishing the papacy and Leo X and making Rome into a great Renaissance center, collecting art, for instance. Um, he was from the house of Medici, he was one of the Medicis, and so very political in his orientation. Um, that, that's one of the reasons that the Catholic Church was not quicker or better at responding to the challenges of the Protestant Reformation, is because they had their own problems. Okay? And one of them was that they had several popes along that time that were not particularly interested in being spiritual or even theological, they were more interested in being secular. Um, there were, however, various lay rulers who were influential at that time, calling for the church to put their house in order. And in fact, a lot of them began to call for a council of the church. You will remember back during the, the conciliar movement, after the, the, um, the Babylonian captivity of the papacy, when you had all of the Avignon popes, where the French were controlling the papacy, and then you had the Great Schism, where you had two or even three popes at one time, and nobody could get their act together about that. Well, that was resolved finally by a church council, and that was the uh, conciliar movement, where a council had authority even of the pope. But after that movement, the, the conciliar movement actually started messing up themselves. They ended up with multiple councils arguing with each other, and so they lost their power, and the pope came back. Well, at this point, people are calling for a new church council to reform the church. The popes are not keen on that, because there are a bunch of popes along this time that really like their power, and they don't want to have another church council if the understanding is that church council is going to have authority even over the pope. It's also true that some of these popes recognized that most of their money was coming from stuff that they shouldn't be doing. For instance, uh, Pope Paul the Third, yeah, Pope Paul the Third, called for a council, uh, not a council, a committee of the church, uh, sort of a blue ribbon committee, to study the problems in the church and decide what needed to be done. Well, this council came back with specific recommendations about nepotism, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And Paul looked at this and said, yeah, but I'm doing all that stuff. <laughs> and he was, he, and he said, thanks, guys, that's great. And then he put it in the drawer. Was not willing to take some action about it. And you had all kinds of people coming along. You know, um, Paul III was succeeded by Clement, uh, Pope Clement. Clement made, um, his two teenage grandsons were made into cardinals. His son he named the Duke of Parma and uh, Pienza. Um, all of this mess. And you're thinking, what is wrong with you guys? And yet people kept coming back and saying, we need to fix this. We need to fix this. And finally, they decided we have to have a council of the church. And they got enough people behind this that in 1545 they called a council of the church in Trent. Charles V is still in charge, and he wanted to Trent because that was in his territory. So 1545, the Council of Trent starts. Pope Julius III um, became Pope right after they started meeting. He was one of the bad ones, had more vices than most of the other popes, and not many virtues to counteract them. Um, and nepotism was common. The, the court of the Vatican, you know, the Vatican court in Rome, was like any secular court. It, it was party time, you know. It's three-day parties twice a week. That's what the Vatican was all about at that time. And so they didn't want to put an end to that. 
So right after Julius became Pope, he suspended the, the meetings of the Council of Trent. Technically, if you look in the history books, the Council of Trent met for 18 years. In actuality, they were in recess most of that time because one thing or another would happen. The, 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 um, at one point, there was a fight between the Pope and Charles V, and so the Pope said, okay, we're moving the council away from Trent, out from under your control, and Charles V said to his bishops, don't you move. So his bishops, from the Holy Roman Empire bishops, stayed in Trent. The, the, the French and Italian bishops went somewhere else. And so that wasn't helping, so they closed their doors for two or three years. And this kept happening, one thing after another. Or a pope would die, and the next pope came on and went, I don't want these people telling me what to do. And he would, he would say, we're going into recess. So for 18 years, this group met, the Council of Trent. But most of that 18 years, they weren't actually meeting. They were in recess. All right. Now, <coughs> Luther, a lot of other people had been saying, we need a council of the church to decide you know, how we fix the things that are wrong with us. So a lot of people, Protestant and Catholic, early Protestant would say that, but the popes opposed it up until the Council of Trent. Finally, when Pope Paul III called all of this and they got together in 1545, they had an unusual responsibility. Most of the great councils of the church, now the Catholic Church considers uh, the, the Council of Trent as being one of the ecumenical councils. Well, it's hardly ecumenical. There were no Protestants there. There were no people from the, the um, Orthodox churches there. Uh, and so only the Catholic Church considers it ecumenical. Ecumenical means universal. Okay, everybody's involved. Um, it actually started out, they only had 31 uh, um, church officials there when they started meeting. By the end, when they're supposed to announce everything, they only had a little over 200. Well, there were a lot more religious uh, people in Europe. But so they were not, did not have a, a strong representation. But most of the councils before that dealt with one issue or two issues at the most. You know, the first council of Nicaea was dealing with the, the heresy that you know, Jesus wasn't divine. And that most of them had one major point. The Council of Trent gets together, and one of the reasons, even though they didn't meet most of this time, one of the reasons it took them 18 years when they did get together is they are trying to address all of the ethical problems in the church the reformation of the Catholic Church from an ethical point of view, plus all of the things that Protestantism had said. Okay, and bottom line is, when they came back with their declarations, the Council of Trent established the official theology of the Protestant Church until the mid-20th century, when Vatican II came along. So for 400 years, the Council of Trent is the, bless you, is the official doctrinal stance. So what was it they actually said? First, they did say we had to have reformation. I can't go into all of it because obviously there's a ton. But they did admit that the church needed to be reformed, and they gave certain orders. Bishops had to reside in their sees. In other words, you couldn't, you couldn't have absenteeism where I'm the bishop of, you know, Hocotepec and I've never been there. They also said that pluralism was condemned. I can't be the bishop of two places at once. Okay. They, um, which a lot of this stuff did not please wealthy bishops, but this is what they decided. In fact, it's probably good they didn't have more representation because if they had, they probably would have more trouble getting this stuff by. The, then they listed what the obligations of the clergy were. If you were a priest, this is what you had to do. If you were a monk, this is what you had to do. This is what it means. So they got rid of a lot of those abuses. And they especially set up, uh, they, they founded seminaries. They declared that seminaries had to be established, and they established minimum requirements for somebody to be a clergy member, which had not existed before. They also regulated the use of such things as relics and indulgences. Now, they didn't do away with them. They just regulated it. You saw recently that, that Pope Francis, did we say that, mention that in here, that Pope Francis said that uh, you can get a plenary indulgence via Twitter? You got seven years off of your time in purgatory? That's, that's the new one. Now, they corrected it later and said, you have to have confessed your sins to a priest, you have to have attended Mass, and if you've done all those things, then let us know and we'll send you a tweet that will give you seven years off of your time in purgatory. So they still do this, okay? But it was controlled. They promoted the study of Thomas Aquinas, making his theology the dominant theology in Catholicism. They took measures against Protestantism, particularly declaring that the Latin translation of the Bible, that is the Latin Vulgate, 
was the authoritative source on all matters of dogma, and that they also said, and this is, this is critically important to us, they declared to the Council of Trent that the tradition of the church, the traditions of the church, that is the traditional authority of the magisterium, magisterium is the, the word for, the, you know, for the, the structure, the leadership structure of the church, that the traditional authority of the uh, magisterium of the church was equal to scripture. Protestants will say, well, how can those Catholics say that? Well, it's because they accept equal to Scripture is the authority of the magisterium of the church. And if in the magisterium of the church they have said something like purgatory or the, you know, or the uh, bodily assumption of Mary or something else that's not in Scripture, they have the authority equal to Scripture. Okay? And that's, that's still doctrinally true today. They established that there were seven sacraments. They said that the Mass is a true sacrifice, very much against the the idea of, technically, the idea of the Catholic Mass is that at every Mass, Jesus is re-crucified, that he is re-sacrificed, and that each time, because he's being re-sacrificed, then the taking of the elements of the Mass, you know, the communion, is, is sufficient grace for you to be forgiven of your sins. And because they believe that you have to take, take the sacraments in order for forgiveness, that grace is imputed to people by receiving the sacraments of the church. Um, they said that communion in both kinds, they heard that the lay people get both the bread and the cup, did not have to happen, was not necessary. They didn't say it couldn't happen, but they said it was not necessary, and that's something the, 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 they strongly advocated them in the Reformation. And they said, and this is the other big thing, the authority issue is one of the ways in which Protestantism and Catholicism today differ. The other way in which we strongly differ is the Council of Trent declared that justification, which means salvation, is based upon good works done through collaboration between grace and the believer. Meaning, it's you and it's God's grace, but you have to do good works to get it. And one of those good works is take the sacraments, for instance. The obedience of the church, etc. That's different. I mean, we, we take very seriously the idea that grace is directly available to us by faith. I mean, we quote Ephesians, you know, too, by grace you are saved through faith, it is a free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The Catholic Church of Trent said good works are necessary for salvation. Right? Um, now, people will say that the Council of Trent was the birth of the modern Catholic Church. The doctrines of Trent were the official position of theology of the Catholic Church from mid-1500s until the mid-1900s. 500, you know, 400 years. And uh, most of it was a reaction against Protestantism. It's simply that. There was also some reformation of the church. But over the next 400 years, everything the church did theologically was an affirmation of Trent, which means virtually everything theological the Catholic Church did over the next 400 years was directly pointed as being against Protestantism. Because the basis of it was Trent, which is against Protestants, all right? Uh, so it was very significant in terms of understanding the history of the church in that regard. Um, and it wasn't until Vatican II, which a lot of Catholics still reject. I mean, the Castle of Trent became so much a part of the Catholic ethos that there were many Catholic orders that, that technically left the Catholic Church at the Second Vatican, Vatican II, Pope John uh, XXIII, called Vatican II because they declared, for instance, that you could still be saved if you weren't Catholic. Now, they didn't actually say it that way, but they said that Protestant believers in Jesus are separated brethren from the same family. Okay, a lot of that has been slowly kind of eroded, but there were people, uh, one of the conferences, uh, when, when my friend, our friend, who's the founder of the American Chesteran Society, Dale Alcos, was speaking in Seattle, we went there, and he always draws a lot of Catholics, because he's Catholic, and Chesteran was Catholic, and there was a group of nuns there, and, and um, Dale was telling us afterwards that they belong to an order, in Latin means, the order of the empty chair. Because they believe that when John the Twenty Third called Vatican II and the decisions of Vatican II, that the Pope at that point became disqualified, and there has not been a valid Pope since. So they believe the chair of Peter in Rome has been empty since Vatican II. Okay. So very strong reactions against that, and that's exactly because Trent, Council of Trent, became the doctrine of the Catholic Church for 400 years, and almost all of it was pointed directly against Protestantism. And that's where some of the strong doctrinal differences are. Any questions about any of that? Yes, Mary. If <clears throat> taking the sacraments according to the Catholic doctrine uh, saves you from sin, 
then why would you have to go to purgatory as well? Well, yeah, the difference, in, the idea behind, some of this is hard for me to explain because uh, I, I can't really get it because I don't really believe it, but um, the idea is that, that people who go to purgatory are saved. But purgatory, you're saved but you're still dirty. So purgatory is where you go to get scrubbed up for a period of time. And that's why different people spend different periods of time in purgatory because different ones need to be cleaned more than others. Okay? So purgatory is the place of purgation or of cleaning out. Not, it's not an issue of you go there and there's still a question mark as whether you're saved or not. It's just a matter of how much cleaning up you need before you're worthy of heaven. Okay. Now, I'm sure that the particular words I'm using would not, may not be acceptable to a traditional Catholic, but that's my understanding of it. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, next week we will pick up with whatever's next. So, thank you. Have a good week.